This video lecture is an introduction to case conceptualization. I recommend watching this video lecture before watching Introduction to Treatment Planning. I think you could watch Introduction to Diagnosis before or after this video lecture, but certainly Introduction to Treatment Planning should follow watching Introduction to Case Conceptualization. Case conceptualization is defined as a map of the case, how you understand the case. You pull together various parts or elements of the case to develop an understanding of where to go next with the case. The most common is the biopsychosocial model, which involves looking at the client's biology or genetics or family history of mental and substance abuse, mental disorders and substance abuse, Psycho psychology, so looking at the client's transference reactions, for example, and social cultural factors. So looking at the client's, say, social class background or their race or ethnicity or their family of origin to understand why the client has developed certain symptoms. From that information, you develop a DSM-5 diagnosis and a treatment plan. We will review the seven areas of case conceptualization. And for more information as we proceed through this video lecture, it may be useful to review the Case Conceptualization Diagnosis and Treatment Planning Guidance Document Template and Template Example. The template is especially important for you to review and understand. This is the document that you're going to be inserting information as you complete cases in Ariadne's thread. And I recommend looking at that template before you watch the rest of this video lecture, just so you get a sense for what information goes where we will be referring a lot to that document as we proceed through not only this video lecture but also introduction to diagnosis and introduction to treatment planning. We're going to watch a video case example that we're going to be expounding upon as we proceed through this video lecture and each of these seven areas of case conceptualization. I used a bit of creative license to fill in some gaps of information from this video as we get to the uh, different sections of case conceptualization and using this example to fill in the blanks. But you should know that uh, this video gives you at least the grounding to the client's presenting issue and how best to help them. It's all my fault that Jabil was killed. I had been drinking that night, and I wasn't thinking clearly to begin with. We were arguing about going to see her parents this weekend. I don't get along with them. I didn't want to go. We were arguing, and I turned to yell at her. Before I could open my mouth, the car slammed into the back of the truck ahead, which I found out later was slowing to make a turn. When I came to, Jill wasn't breathing. There was blood everywhere. thinking about just then? Huh? What? What were you thinking about just then? I'm... I'm not sure. What were we talking about? Okay, so that was the case example that we're going to be following as we proceed through the next seven sections or areas of case conceptualization. Pertinent elements, social and cultural influences, provisional diagnosis and hypothesis, theoretical approach, initial interventions, transference and counter-transference, and legal and ethical issues. Let's begin with pertinent elements.
pertinent elements involves identifying the most salient and important pieces of information in the case. It is better to be concise here than overly detailed. While you should cover all of the most pertinent information, be selective. You would want to include the reason for referral, in other words, the reason that the client is seeking counseling services, who referred the client, whether they are self-referred or referred by a family member, or even outside of their family, such as a probation officer or school employee, what the client's treatment goals are, what the client wants to accomplish in therapy, and what details are most important to the case. Here's a case example. Duncan is a 27-year-old male of Scandinavian American ethnicity brought in for counseling by self-referral. Remember, I'm using a bit of creative license here. The presenting concerns were pervasive feelings of sadness and grief alongside pervasive guilt and inability to control intrusive thoughts and memories of a recent traumatic event, a recent motor vehicle accident, or MVA. This accident made the local television news, as his girlfriend died as a result of the accident. Duncan was the driver. From the client's perspective, he was referred to counseling services because of concerns about getting fired from his job because of his struggles with inattention and absent-mindedness at work subsequent to the motor vehicle accident. Duncan admits to withdrawing from relationships and being reticent to form new relationships out of fear of losing others. This is an important component for treatment planning as an aside because you will have clients who will overgeneralize various events in their lives to the extent that they push others out, they feel like they cannot trust anyone, or they're afraid of opening themselves up to others. And this lack of interpersonal contact based on that cognitive error, if you will, will cause significant distress and impairment if it's not uh, addressed. The most pertinent elements of this case include Duncan's drinking on the night of the motor vehicle accident, the death of his girlfriend, his resulting trauma and depressive symptoms, his regret for drinking on the night of the accident and taking responsibility, and that strengths focus is very important to mention, especially before we move to the pro provisional diagnosis and hypothesis, which tends to focus more on the pro client's problems than their strengths. His family history of potential alcoholism and anxiety, and his concerns about losing his job related to what seemed to be symptoms of dissociation. So that's pertinent elements. Social and cultural influences. We want to know what elements of this person's social and cultural background may have influenced their symptoms or presentation. Let's look at social influences first. These may include primary support group, for someone who lives at home, this could be their parents or guardians. We also would consider for an adult, someone like a partner or a spouse. Income level, family background, marital and or parental status, legal status, so this is for example involvement in the legal system, whether a person has charges pending or if they're on probation or recently released from an institution, work history, and access to medical care. Cultural influences include age, gender, race and ethnicity, social class, ability or disability status, sexual or affective orientation, spiritual or religious tradition, membership of a cultural subgroup such as perhaps being a fan of Star Trek known as a Trekkie or you could be um, a particular sports fan for example or even someone who's the member of Mensa or um, perhaps even a, someone who's a skateboarder, who's a skater. All of those are various subgroups within our culture. And norms of geographical location. So someone who lives in the Midwest has very different cultural expectations for what's considered more typical or accepted behavior compared to someone who lives in the Northwest or the Northeast or even Texas in the South. 
so understanding the norms of geographical location is important when working with clients. We want to consider how these variables may have impacted stigma or a person's attitude towards mental health. They may be more or less likely to seek counseling services based on some of these variables. We also want to consider how any experiences of di discrimination, oppression, prejudice or marginalization may have impacted the person and also consider any family history of mental disorders or addiction. This is the biological or genetic influence on mental disorders. If information is unknown about social or cultural background, you would indicate this specifically, for example, of unknown racial or ethnic background. You won't always have all of the information needed to make a completely uh, accurate case conceptualization, but when you are missing information, it's important to note that. So here's a case example. Duncan has lived in Seattle for most of his adult life. He is an only child. The cultures that seem to be most contributing to his or her current experience are Scandinavian American ethnicity, working class status, and a member of the millennial generation. These influences have led him to develop a Protestant work ethic. This has the influence of ethnicity and social class while also valuing connection to friends and family as part of the millennial generation. Of note, many of Duncan's family are social drinkers and he wonders if his father is an undiagnosed alcoholic. Duncan acknowledged drinking alcohol on the night of the motor vehicle accident, so here we can see the potential for family history to influence the client's behavior. The strengths that seem most relevant to his current development are Duncan's sense of right and wrong, his concern for the well-being of others, and ability to take responsibility for his own actions. As I mentioned earlier, pointing out a client's strength is important before we move to the provisional diagnosis and hypothesis section, since that section tends to focus more on the client's weaknesses than strengths. In order to place Duncan's symptoms in context, it is important to note that there is a family history of panic disorders on his mother's side, both his aunt and his grandmother. So now we understand some of the genetic predispositions, not only alcohol use on his father's side, but also some anxiety or panic on his mother's side. So now that we've collected that information, we provide a formal provisional DSM-5 diagnosis for the case. Provisional means basically a working diagnosis that can be modified as we learn more information. We articulate why we selected that diagnosis by listing symptoms that the person is experiencing. We provide a rationale for why we selected that diagnosis rather than other competing choices known as differential diagnosis. So we specifically mention the other diagnosis we were considering and why those were not a better fit. Your diagnosis should be in the ballpark, and as you watch the introduction to diagnosis section, you will understand better what that means. You should also indicate what kinds of information you would need to finalize the diagnosis. You also want to provide information about core issues that need to be resolved for the client's symptoms to be addressed fully. For example, it's useful to know what symptoms they're currently experiencing and from the case we know they're experiencing flashbacks, dissociative episodes, even some sadness. And we also want to be aware of what isn't always apparent, some of the root issues and patterns that may be creating symptoms. So for example, Duncan may be someone who has low self-worth, low self-esteem, someone who uh, tends to internalize events and blame himself for things that are outside of his control. He may also be someone who's experiencing uh, some form of trauma related to his uh, loss of his girlfriend and the, just the trauma of the motor vehicle accident. And that may well be causing symptoms such as depression, despondency related to that grief and loss. Now the reason why the, it's important to identify both symptoms, what you see, as the, the diagram shows, and also root problems, what you don't always see, 
is because if we just assist the client to manage their symptoms to stabilize, it's likely that those will return without resolving the root issues and patterns, which tend to, as with most plants, cause the reemergence of, uh, of what we see, if that makes sense. So we have to address root problems at some point to help the client with long-term recovery. Here's a case example. Duncan best fits the profile of a person with post-traumatic stress disorder. That's our provisional diagnosis for the case. He is experiencing nightmares, avoidance and psychic numbing, and episodes of dissociation that include flashbacks of the motor vehicle accident, which started two days after the accident, has lasted more than one month, and occurs multiple times a day for periods for up to an hour at a time. Notice here that we are stressing the timeline of those symptoms with indicating how often they occur, how many times per day, how long are they last, the duration of those symptoms. And when we start to make a diagnosis, and as you look through some of the DSM, you will see that the diagnostic criteria often include timelines. So for example, with major depressive disorder, a person has to have be symptomatic for two weeks. You want to know those timelines and speak to them during uh, your provisional diagnosis section. Duncan exhibits these symptoms in his relationships with both his family, friends, and other professionals in his home, work, and other social environments. So for example, counseling appointments. These symptoms cause distress in terms of Duncan's overall mood, which has become increasingly discouraged and sad if not depressed. While he has been, un he has been able to work since the incident, he reports difficulty concentrating and is afraid of losing his job. Here we see the impact of the mental disorder. Now we list the secondary diagnosis. Duncan also fits the profile of a person with unspecified depressive disorder. While he exhibits a blue or low mood, Duncan does not report significant appetite or sleep disturbances. That's a major marker of clinical depression or major depressive disorder. Or anhedonia, the loss of interest in things one we used to enjoy. In addition to not fully meeting the criteria for major depressive disorder, it is unclear whether his current depressive mood state is caused solely by his grief to the loss of his girlfriend, known as bereavement, or normal bereavement. Major depressive disorder could be ruled out. This is an important uh, part of the example to review with you because it helps you understand what kinds of information you're providing for diagnoses that you're not completely confident about. You may well think the client has depression of some form, but he doesn't seem to meet full criteria for what's called major depressive disorder. So what else could he be given? Well, an unspecified depressive disorder is essentially saying there is some depression there, but we're not sure to what extent and this is useful because the client does not have some of the most significant symptoms of depression. He doesn't seem to meet criteria. And it's unclear, and this is an important distinction, whether or not his mood state is just caused by his grief or loss, or whether it extends beyond that, whether the client is now starting to beat themselves up, call themselves worthless or a, a hopeless person who cannot change things around them, um, who has some negative self-opinions of himself and uh, perhaps even starts to develop sleep or appetite difficulties. You can see here that those symptoms extend beyond typical grief and loss. Whereas if the client was just very, very sad about the loss of a loved one, perhaps even wishing to be with them, that would be fairly normal uh, bereavement. So, But we don't know which is which. We don't have enough information. Therefore, unspecified depression makes sense. We also have a rule out, which we're going to be exploring just in a moment. And as you get to the introduction to diagnosis section, you will understand that a rule out is essentially a diagnosis that you're not um, sure about to any extent. You're not confident about it, but you just want to make sure it's not there. So you want to gather some more information to rule it out. Duncan seems to meet the criteria for alcohol intoxication rather than an alcohol use disorder 
since the frequency, duration, and intensity of his alcohol use is unknown at this time. An alcohol use disorder could be ruled out. Just like with major depressive disorder, it doesn't seem like the client has an alcohol use disorder based on the information that we have, but it's a possibility, and we want to be aware of that and to rule it out as time goes on. Alcohol intoxication is basically being intoxicated uh, on alcohol, and an alcohol use disorder is more of a formal addiction diagnosis. Other conditions that may be the focus of clinical attention include Duncan's threat of losing his job due to dissociative episodes diagnosed in DSM-5 as other problem related to employment. Here we see some of the other social and cultural um, factors that are playing into this case that we want to be including as part of the diagnosis because remember Duncan is coming to counseling because of his fear of job loss. It is hypothesized that a core issue in Duncan's case, so we've gotten to the diagnosis, now we're getting to the core issue, is unresolved loss and grief from the death of his girlfriend during the motor vehicle accident. Being the driver, Duncan feels significant guilt and may be struggling with forgiving himself. The unresolved nature of the loss may be increasing the frequency of dissociative episodes and flashbacks, meaning if we do not help the client to resolve or accept the loss in some way, he may continue to have dissociative episodes and flashbacks or the re-emergence of symptoms even after we have stabilized him. So now we've gone through provisional diagnosis and hypothesis, we are going to move on to theoretical approach. This is the theory you have selected which is going to address the client's issues. Now remember you should be identifying a diagnosis first before selecting a theory. This is because your theory and interventions should directly address the, high, the diagnosis, so you need the diagnosis first. In addition, the theoretical approach that you choose or select should be accurately described. Your description should not meld elements of other theories, so for example if you are using person-centered therapy, you should not be saying that you will use the technique of relaxation uh, uh, and calming, soothing techniques as part of your interventions because that is not consistent with person-centered therapy. Relaxation techniques actually come from cognitive behavior therapy. So make sure that the interventions you describe are consistent with the theory you've selected. You also want to mention service level on the continuum of care. Service level is the difference between outpatient services partial inpatient services like a day program, full inpatient services which is an overnight program, and residential services which is when a person is staying at a facility for potentially years at a time. You can see here that there's a large difference in the type of um, intensity of services provided to them that you want to be aware of. Most clients that you're going to see and write about as part of your case conceptualizations are going to be receiving outpatient level of service. Tips for selecting theories and interventions. This is useful to talk about because you may well be wondering, well, is there one theory that's better than another for certain diagnoses? If you know about the common factors movement in research regarding counseling and psychotherapy. You understand that common factors such as the relationship with the therapist, the therapist themselves, and the client themselves influence the likelihood of a successful counseling outcome far more than the theoretical approach. Therefore, choosing theoretical approach is largely up to you because anything you choose is going to be effective so long as you believe in it. That's called allegiance and the client believes in it. That's known as expectancy. Targeting specific problems with interventions can be useful for this same purpose of allegiance and expectancy because you expect change to happen and the client expects change to happen. It is common practice in the field to directly address problems with interventions and insurance companies usually require this. So once you have identified a specific problem, say dissociation, then you, were then you would uh, identify a specific treatment intervention for that, so let's say grounding techniques. This is an example or uh, a visual model really uh, 
of common factors that you may have seen before. The yellow circle is client or extra therapeutic factors, and remember this represents 87% of the reason why clients change. Of that 13% that's left, the following the treatment effects, the following effects are noted as part of that. The first and largest is therapist effects. That's who you are as a therapist. The second largest is alliance effects. That's your relationship with the client. The third is model or technique delivered, and this has to do with the expectancy or allegiance to the rationale and ritual. The fourth is feedback effects. That's the use of uh, client feedback in modifying your approach to treatment. And you'll notice that model and technique is a very small green circle there in that 13%. It's only 8% of 13%, which if you do the math is only about 1% of the reason why clients change. Very, very small. So like I had mentioned um, in the previous slide, you can choose whatever theoretical approach you feel is best for the client because as long as you believe in it and the client believes in it, you'll be okay. I like the transcultural model as a way of kind of conceptualizing how to select theories, especially if you're going to be integrating theories. Healing procedures, according to Frank and Frank, involve four elements, a relationship with the healer, expectancy that change is going to occur by both the healer and the person being healed, a myth of why healing is going to take place and how it's going to take place, and a ritual as part of the myth of how exactly you're going to um, intervene and to assist the client to resolve some of the issues that they have. This model is used not only for counseling and psychotherapy, but also for shamanistic rituals and things of that nature. So let's look at these uh, four areas in broader context so you understand them. Relationship, this is the client's emotionally charged and confiding relationship with the healer. Expectancy, this has to do with the privileged position of the healer within the client's culture the context and the setting. So if a client, for example, is in a setting that is associated with healing, that's why certain office decor look a certain way, because it has a healing uh, uh, tone, a uh, cultural tone to the client. And the client's belief in the myth and the healer's allegiance to the myth. The myth is an explanation for the nature of the client's problems and a rationale for the healer's actions. In counseling, this is known as theoretical orientation. Ritual is the healer's method for resolving the client's problems. This is the technique, procedure, the intervention. So in other words, your theoretical approach is the myth and your initial interventions is the ritual. If you do select more than one theory, and I don't recommend doing so, write about how you will integrate these. Especially consider how you will navigate your in-session behavior with a client. Not only what you will do with the client, but also how you will be with the client. And I'll give you an example of that. If you are transitioning between, say, a very structured therapy like cognitive behavior therapy and a very unstructured therapy like psychodynamic therapy, let's say, your in-session behavior is going to look quite awkward and different based on the theory you have selected. So if you're doing some cognitive behavioral work, you're going to be fairly directive, educating the client. If you're doing psychodynamic work, you're going to stay back a lot more, do some refre reflective listening, and allow the client to do most of the work. Those two positions are going to seem fairly awkward to the client if they're used in the same session, or even if they're used from one session to another. The client won't know who they have in the room with them, what to expect. So you have to be able to articulate directly to the client why you are <laughs> behaving differently, either in the same session or across sessions, so the client can expect that. So I want that to be articulated in your case conceptualization if you are indeed integrating different theories. Unless you feel comfortable with articulating how you will let the client know you are transitioning between theoretical approaches, I recommend avoiding integrating theory because you will get stuck in that um, without uh, fully identifying how you're going to tell the client that you are transitioning. 
For detailed examples, and I've provided uh, several detailed examples of how you would articulate the transition between different theories, see the Case Conceptualization, Diagnosis and Treatment Planning Guidance Document. This theoretical spectrum is useful to look at when considering the integration of theories. Remember that some theories are specific, concrete, short to have specific concrete and short-term objectives are structured and more psychoeducational. Theories like this are solution-focused brief therapy, rational emotive behavior therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, and to some extent, transactional analysis. Whereas, on the other end, there are therapies that are more general, have more global and long-term objectives, are less structured and more process-based, feminist theory, systems theory, psychodynamic theory, Jungian theory, existential theory, even person-centered therapy, all have quite a different uh, approach compared to the more structured therapies. So when you are considering one or the other, just know that uh, the integration of those is going to be successful or not based on how comparable they are uh, regarding their structured nature. It's easier, for example, to integrate systems theory with psychodynamic theory than it is to integrate systems theory with, say, solution-focused brief therapy. Likewise, it is easier to integrate, on the other end of the spectrum, solution-focused brief therapy and rational emotive behavior therapy than it is to integrate solution-focused brief therapy with, say, psychodynamic therapy. I hope that makes sense. Okay, case example for theoretical approach. Remember, we have a primary diagnosis of PTSD, so we want to be addressing that in our theoretical approach section. The theoretical approach that the client would most benefit from is trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. This approach is likely to be successful because of Duncan's symptoms of trauma that need to be reduced for Duncan to attend meaningfully to other areas of his treatment. This would also prevent Duncan from losing his job due to inattention, which are hypothesized to be dissociative episodes. So you see here that we have chosen a theory based on the client's diagnosis. Duncan currently seems to meet the criteria for outpatient service level on the continuum of care. He may need higher frequency, such as twice weekly sessions, to begin in order to stabilize some of his most prominent symptoms. A more intensive level of care is not indicated at this time because Duncan is not suicidal or homicidal and seems to be functioning to the degree that he can sustain his current employment, albeit tenuously. In other words, Duncan does not require a day program or an inpatient program at this time. Okay, initial interventions next. Now that we have decided on the theory that we're going to be using with the client based on their diagnosis, we start to plan out our initial interventions. And as you get to treatment planning, you will notice that initial interventions are followed by subsequent interventions and the closing um, uh, interventions. But we're just going to focus on what you do first with the client, your initial interventions, right now. The reason I mentioned in your treatment plan you have initial, subsequent, and closing interventions is that it is useful to consider the flow of treatment when starting to plan out the interventions you're going to use. We first think of what needs to be addressed first to stabilize the client. These are our initial interventions. Then we think about what core issues need to be resolved for the client to sustain long-term recovery. In other words, what deeper core issues do we need to eventually address? And for, finally, what would be the focus of the last two or three sessions for treatment to successfully conclude? What have we already uh, established or achieved in the first two goals, so stabilization and then also the core issues, that we can help the client to uh, be best prepared to face or deal with or cope with as they are ready to conclude therapy. With your initial interventions, do remember that your interventions should directly target your primary diagnosis and should match your theoretical approach. I have provided very detailed examples 
in your CCDTP guidance document. Here is our case example. Initial interventions include writing a trauma narrative, being trained in relaxation techniques, and processing his narrative using subjective units of distress scaling. These interventions directly target PTSD symptoms and are consistent with trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. So here you see we have identified interventions that are consistent with trauma-focused CBT that directly target the PTSD. That's really the focus of your initial interventions. Once Duncan has managed to mitigate his immediate suffering, in other words to stabilize, deeper themes can be addressed. This is your subsequent interventions. These include grief, loss and guilt from his choice to drink while driving on the no night of the motor vehicle accident when his girlfriend was killed. Furthermore, Duncan's avoidance of interpersonal contact with others for fear of harming them needs to be addressed and we could use some cognitive behavioral techniques for that, such as modifying his cognitions. When selecting theories and interventions, remember that, here's a review, interventions should directly target your primary diagnosis, your chosen theoretical approach should be accurately described, your initial interventions should match your theoretical approach, and if you select more than one theory, write about how you will integrate these in the session. Next we look at transference and countertransference, our sixth area. Here we have to be a bit creative. Transference and countertransference will not always be readily apparent to you while you're working with clients and that's just the nature of countertransference and transference. For transference, we consider some ways in which the client may respond to you based on your appearance or presentation. The important thing here is that you think about who you are personally and try to imagine what the client might respond to based on you rather than someone else. Here are some examples of transference. And these are just examples. I should add that it's really going to vary based on who you are and what the client's history is based on who you present as. These are just some examples. Considering that the client feels they can never please their parents, he may feel a need to please me since I'm around the same age as his parents. The client may want to take care of me like she does her own children since I'm around the same age as her children. The client may displace anger towards me as a male based on prior failed marriages with disappointing men. The client may fear that I will judge him for being a gay man as most people in his life seem to have done. So here we have, um, first off, the, a teenager who may uh, evaluate you based on your age, being the same age as his parents. Second, we have a parent who may evaluate you again based on your age, since you're the same age as the ch her children. Third, you have a client who may feel anger towards you based on gender because of their disappointing relationships with people of your gender. And fourth, we have this potential fear of being judged that is grounded in just um, maybe an appraisal of you not being part of a community. For example, the client may imagine that you are not part of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community and may therefore um, uh, think that you're going to judge them based on not having that membership. Countertransference is about personal history in addition to your emotional response or values. Here you consider what parts of your own personal history or experience might play out in the case. I want you to think about what issues might impact you personally and be very specific to your own experience here. Again, you're thinking about what might, may impact you differently than someone else. Here are some examples of countertransference, and again, these are going to vary based on your own experience. Here are some examples of first personal history or experience related to countertransference, and then emotional response or values later based on your own countertransference, your own history. First, Let's look at personal history or experience. My own experience of do dogmatic religious belief systems, perhaps you've been someone raised 
in a um, religious background that has a particularly dogmatic approach to spirituality. My own history of difficult relationships with family of origin. Let's say the client has difficult relationships with their family of origin, and you do too, and you may transfer some of your experience onto the client. Your own experiences with depression. So you've had some experience with struggling with depression, and you imagine the client's experience is similar to your own. Projecting my sister's issues onto the client. Perhaps your sister has similar issues to what the client is going through, and you imagine the client to be quite similar to your sister when they are not. Examples of emotional response or values include judgment of the client's behavior. So, for example, if they are binge drinking, you may have particular uh, judgments about binge drinking based on that, or if they're engaging in, say, drug use, or if they are, I don't know, a member of a community that you disapprove of, um, you may have judgments based on that. My own beliefs about and then what your own beliefs are around certain topics, whatever those are. For example, a common one is staying together versus getting divorced. That can bring up certain values for certain people. And also frustration with the client for, let's say, the client isn't acting in their best interests or is acting in a way that you believe is harmful to them and you may be grow frustrated with the client for um, doing so. I think in, a be in, in many ways, personal history or experience is a better representation of countertransference than emotional response or values. Um, and I do want you to be considering your own history when writing in this section about your countertransference. And this is going to feel a bit awkward because you're going to be describing your own stuff in this uh, case conceptualization. And you wouldn't necessarily do that in a lot of great detail when doing formal client work but you would say enough that it would be apparent that you have an understanding of what the client is going through or at least have the potential issue of transferring something onto the client. So I do want you to be using your own um, personal insights from your history to be informing the counter-transference section. And again, this isn't necessarily something you would be writing in a client conceptualization in formal practice, but is important for you to be using if you're going to be working with a client and you're going to be aware of that. Here's an example of transference and countertransference using our case. Potential transference reactions include his possible projection of self-blame onto his therapist. Duncan may expect me to chastise him for his own behavior. He may also struggle with disclosing his innermost thoughts and feelings for fear of losing another significant person in his life. So here we see the projection of self-blame onto me. Notice though that there is nothing about me personally here, so I would need to add something else about who I am and what Duncan might think based on who I am. So for example, let's say I dress in more um, uh, white collar clothing, and Duncan is someone we know from a working class background. He may have a response to that based on his own personal history of someone from the the uh, the middle class, if you will, from the professional class. Counter-transference reactions include my own per past history with binge drinking, alongside my stereotypes of this problem existing mostly with young adult males. I may lack an understanding of what it means to grow up in a working class family. Supervision and consultation could be useful for understanding Duncan's working class background and putting boundaries around my own experience of binge drinking. Here we are talking about my own past history and how that may inform my approach to working with the client. Notice that I am open about lacking information or knowledge about certain issues such as growing up in a working class family and not assuming that I know about that, taking a not knowing stance. And I've also articulated how I could use supervision and consultation to help me with some of these issues. That's very important in the transference and countertransference section the understanding of how you could use supervision or consultation. Legal issues and ethical issues is the seventh and last section. Here we pay close attention to the potential issues in the case. Some cases will have major issues and others will not. 
This is true both in clinical practice and in the cases you will be reading about. All major issues that you see should be addressed. I encourage students to articulate standard ethical practice in every case conceptualization. You can almost have a script for this really and plug it in, such as a discussing informed consent, a professional disclosure, disclosure statement, limits of confidentiality, fee arrangements and scheduling. As a rule, articulating when clinical supervision and consultation can be useful is a critical element of this section in addition to the transference and countertransference section. I will also add that in regards to things like limits of confidentiality, you may want to be very specific if the client is uh, has the potential legal or ethical issue of say they are suicidal or there's a potential abuse reporting requirement. You want to specifically mention uh, in your write-up that limits of confidentiality will be discussed specifically regarding the client's suicidal ideation or specifically regarding the possibility of being a mandated reporter of child or adult abuse or neglect. Here are some of the major legal or ethical issues which you should be aware of. I suggest consulting your code of ethics to r remind yourself of all of the ethical issues that could come up but these are the most common in client work so I do want to go through these um, at least so you understand some of the main ones. In terms of limits to confidentiality which we were just talking about there is duty to protect in the case of active suicidal threat and there are procedures for handling this so you want to articulate not only that the client is feeling suicidal and unable to plan out uh, how they're going to take care of their own safety but, and also you want to talk about what procedures you might have for assisting the client to remain safe if they feel unable to do so um, on their own. Duty to warn in the case of homicidal threat this is very important based on the Tarasov case whereby both the counselor and the supervisor were found to be liable for not directly informing the target of um, the uh, uh, the client's r r age, uh, rage or anger which is Tatiana Tarasov she was not informed and she was killed by the client and both the counselor and the supervisor were found liable so again you want to know the procedures for handling this how you're going to contact the target of the anger or the violence you also want to talk about your duty to report abuse and neglect in children and the elderly and procedures for handling this. Again, calling up CPS, those kinds of things, or APS. Other major or le uh, legal or ethical issues, other major issues to be aware of. Dual relationships. So if you know the client outside of the counseling session or a family member or have an environment that you may be interacting with them outside of the counseling setting you want to be aware of that not engaging in sexual relationships with current or former clients subpoenas involving therapists and malpractice suits against therapists if the client is facing legal charges you want to be very aware of that because you may be dragged into a legal battle same if a client is potentially are going to be seeking a divorce you may be pulled into a court of law if there are issues with the divorce proceedings and especially if there is a child custody issue those can be very sticky and it's very useful to talk directly with clients about how if you don't do that kind of work that you don't do child custody evaluations if that comes up also be aware that some parents may take their children out of state without the permission of the other parent and this is actually known as child kidnapping. Now there are certain parameters around what you can and cannot tell authorities with regards to child kidnapping but you want to be aware of those and researching those and articulating that you will research those requirements in your case conceptualization. Legal or ethical issues are about the counseling relationship not the client's history. Some students misunderstand this. So some correct examples would be professional boundaries related to sexual issues. That's a counseling relationship issue. Child welfare related to adequate supervision of a 16 year old son. This is a counseling relationship issue because you have specific reporting requirements as a counselor. 
possibility of homicidal ideation and disclosures under the Tarasov provision. Again, the counselor has actions there uh, based on the counseling relationship. Who has access to the client's record? This is also a legal or, eth issue, a legal or ethical issue that's about the counseling relationship. And you will have various people outside of the client requesting access to the record who do not have access. And you need to know what their rights are and what the client's rights are. The therapist's role in arbitrating a will, a client's will. There are also some parameters around that that has to do with the counseling relationship. These all are about the counselor's role in relation to the client. Here are some incorrect examples, and these are all about the client with really no implication for the counselor. The client is using drugs. You really can't do a whole lot about that. If the client is using drugs, you're not going to be telling people about that. That's still confidential. You're not going to be calling up the police. And so it's not particularly a legal or ethical issue because that's the client's issue, not yours. The client is stealing or committing illegal acts. Now, the client may well be facing legal charges for this or may well get into trouble for this, but it is not anything that you are that is actionable. You must keep all that information confidential. In fact, one of the... Uh, one of the most interesting um, caveats to homicidal ideation that is frequently discussed in this class with students is if you have a client who actually has killed somebody in the past, you cannot report that to the police. That is confidential information. However, if the client is threatening to kill somebody, then that is reportable to the police. So there's a strange discrepancy there between those issues. The client is engaged in legal issues related to arbitrating a will. Now remember, that's just to do with the client. The client is going to be arbitrating the will. Unless you are involved, that is not a counseling issue. So I want to be very clear here that legal or ethical issues pertains to your role in the counseling relationship, not to the client's legal charges, legal history. That's part of pertinent elements, not legal and ethical issues re related to the counseling relationship. Here's an example from our case. Legal and ethical concerns include the potential for Duncan to request me as a character witness if he is called to court to face charges for his motor vehicle accident and potentially a G DUI charge or drunk driving under the influence. The basics of confidentiality informed consent, disclosure of services provided, and fee arrangements will need to be addressed from the outset. In addition, I will use consultation and supervision to ensure I am receiving any additional support while providing trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. In a fairly complex case, I will be mindful of practicing within my bounds of competence and seek assistance when needed. This is always important to articulate, especially if you don't feel confident about using a particular technique or theory, or if you believe the case is just quite complicated. Using supervision and consultation is a very ethical approach to working with complex cases or when using approaches that you aren't fully confident in. So we've reached the summary. We have now gone through pertinent elements, social and cultural influences, provisional diagnosis and hypothesis, theoretical approach, initial interventions, transference and counter-transference, and legal and ethical issues. This concludes the introduction to case conceptualization.